I want to explore how poetry is a mercy to us in this day and age. I want to explore how poetry can help us attend to life's intimate immensities and immense intimacies. I want to look at how poetry presents us with some difficulty, which is a very important part of the spiritual life, helping to change our full stops into commas. And then I want to look at five poems, all of which I think show an aspect of mercy, mercy to the self, uh, mercy to our human fragility, human to the natural world, uh, and also to death. And then I want to look finally at a poem that I think um, beautifully explores the mercy of God towards human beings. And uh, at the end of the day, my belief is that God is in this world as poetry is in the poem. And so tonight is a, is a wonderful place to be. So I'm looking forward to talking about the quality of mercy in poetry. I've been asked to draw on my own poems and I'm going to start with a poem inspired by the shortest sentence in the scripture which is Jesus wept and I'm going to talk about how looking at the world and ourselves through the tears of God might change our perspective and then I'm going to range in poetry over a series of, of different places but particularly in the end coming to the cross as a source of unquenchable always renewing, all-forgiving love. Um, we're going to move back and forth, if you like, between Calvary as the place where it was won and the wedding feast at Cana as the place where it's celebrated. A very warm welcome to St. Martin in the Fields this evening. It is a very great privilege to introduce our last and final lecture in the 2019 Quality of Mercy Autumn Lecture Series, in which we've been exploring the quality of mercy in preaching, in social justice, in story, in song and drama. Tonight, in this last lecture, we will be exploring the quality of mercy in poetry. R.S. Thomas describes poetry as that which arrives at the intellect by way of the heart. So as we open ourselves up by way of the heart this evening, we might discover that poetry leads us beyond the simply literal into deeper truths of imagination, into the mystery of our lives and our relationships with one another and God. There can be a formational quality to poetry that can excite and delight, inspire and console, even cleanse us as we reimagine the world in fresh ways. We are extremely fortunate tonight to have two speakers who could not be better qualified to speak about the quality of mercy in poetry. They are friends of this church, two people who have done so much to broaden, broaden the reach of poetry beyond the academy to the hearts of all people. Our first speaker tonight is the Reverend Canon Mark Oakley, Dean of St. John's College, Cambridge, and a former residentiary canon of St. Paul's Cathedral. Mark is the author of several books, including The Splash of Words, Believing in Poetry, which won the 2019 Michael Ramsey Prize for Theological Writing. Archbishop Justin Welby writes of this book, Mark Oakley's work shines with an infectious love for poetry and for theology. Mark shows us how poetry can change our whole view of the world. His latest book to be published at the end of this month is entitled My Sour Sweet Days, George Herbert and the Journey of the Soul. We are also delighted to have with us Malcolm Geit, who is chaplain of Girton College, Cambridge. Malcolm recently 
led a retreat for clergy from across the whole of central London, where he thrilled us with his insights and wisdom and shared generously his sonnets, many taken from his latest book, After Prayer. I can see some clergy are back for more tonight. Malcolm is widely published in poetry and theology. His regular column in the Church Times Poets' Corner is a delight to the reader's eye. Our speakers will speak for 25 minutes, and then there will be a time of questions. So let us then welcome our first speaker, Mark Oakley. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be back here at St. Martin's and a great honor to be a part of this wonderful series. I used to be the rector of the neighboring parish uh, at the Actors Church in Covent Garden. And I was told when I was there that the shortest ever run of a play here in the West End was a play called Halfway to Hell. It was 1918, and it only ran for the first half of the first performance (laughs) because everybody left at the interval. (laughs) The following day, the Times published its review. The author of Halfway to Hell, it said, rather underestimated the distance. It began at 8 p.m. sharp. It ended at 9 p.m. dull. Well, on a Monday evening at 7 p.m., let's say I'm hoping for an audience with a little more patience. I won't speak for too long, though, about 25 minutes, just to prompt some thoughts as to how poetry and mercy might overlap. I'll include a few poems en route in the hope that we can make some connections. And at this stage of the evening, I'm taking comfort in the words of Quentin Crisp, that if at first you don't succeed, failure may be your style. (laughs) The first thing I want to say is that I believe poetry to be a mercy by which I mean that there is something in the being of poetry and its relationship to the human that ultimately works as a mercy. For all we are, as human beings, our competitions and cruelties, our masks and camouflage, our pretensions and self-obsessions, our spending money we don't have on things we don't want, in order to impress people we don't like, and for all the ways we brutalize language, this great gift we have with its art of expression and connection and meaning-making, for all the ways we instead employ language cynically, cheaply, seductively, as a channel for the lie and for hate, for all that... Poetry looks in judgment and yet still reaches out to our soul. And it reaches out in many ways. First, it can ask us to wake up, to stop snoring through life, to pay attention, to attend to the intimate immensities of life, and of the world, and to the immense intimacies of life and the world. It helps us retrieve the lost notes of the score we have simmered down to live by. Poetry is the antennae of the world. It helps us eavesdrop on ourselves and this place in which we find ourselves so mysteriously alive. Poetry is a language that makes us shut up at times, helping to make music out of noise. Poetry is the art that made Emily Dickinson say, 
To be alive is so amazing, there's hardly time for anything else. (laughs) Secondly, it can reach out by difficulty, reminding us of the importance of that moment when a human being has to say, I don't know, I don't understand. The recognitions that come with that moment in a life can be potentially transformative, are hard full stops turned into commas. Such difficulty in poetry, as Geoffrey Hill used to say, remind us that life too is difficult and that difficulty is very democratic as it places us all equally in the dark and yet with all a voice in it too to make the journey. Poetry can act as a necessary counter-challenge to our propensity to make the honestly complex something dishonestly simple, something that's happening a lot at the moment in the political world, honest complexity being turned into dishonest simplicity. All I have is a voice to undo the folded lie writes Auden. Folded? What, in a newspaper? In packaging? In my heart? In my relationships? In my country? To unfold the lie in a language, but not as we know it, can be both dislocating, but with an attached sense of homeward bound. We may not immediately understand poetry, but we sense that it understands us. Where does your poetry come from? Michael Longley was famously asked. If I knew where poems came from, he said, I'd go and live there. (laughs) Thirdly, poetry can reach out with what Keats called in that letter of 1817 negative capability. That is, when a person is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. To ask the question, what did that mean after listening to a piece of music, would be very odd, and to have missed the point, perhaps. So with poetry. The meaning is in the responses to the words patterned on page and in sound and in rhythm. The poem is not a place to be categorically convinced of anything. It is a good place to be serially convinced, convinced for a moment and then to change one's mind, see a fresh perspective again, again. Auden described poetry as the clear expression of mixed feelings. Poetry has mercy on those feelings, on our inability to be purely rational, black and white, univocal. It says to us, that's fine. That's who we are. It's more than that. It's our richness. To be in uncertainties and mysteries To see that there is rarely one meaning or side to anything is a challenge to us as we hear ourselves and each other a little better. Poetry is, as Les Murray termed it, whole speak, not narrow speak, or resonance, not relevance. Any fundamentalism is to being human what paint by numbers is to art. Clarity does not always mean simplicity. Poetry is the means into an exploration. It's not the delivery of a message. Poetry helps us get in touch with subversion, that is, a subversion of reality, the density of what is rather than a surface representation of it. Poetry's density of suggestion 
is its real beauty. To read a poem together and then to talk about it is an amazing experience. You each give your response and you hear things and see things suddenly as others speak that you had never known or even thought about. And as all these meanings are placed together, we end up with one big meaning that no one had had at all. All are enlarged, challenged, equal. All end up usually hungry for more. We start to wonder how humanity might work if we cared less about making a point than about making a difference in this way. And as the car is driven home or the walk through the park the next day occurs, that poem is still doing its work of settling, unsettling, casting colours on our sepia-toned life. That is a great mercy. It is a life rope to save us drowning in our own shallows. It can warn us too against mere traditionalism, that peer pressure from the dead. It can warn us too not to believe everything we think. Poetry is a word formation that hears us and seeks to rescue so that we can better enjoy life or endure life, as Johnson would say. It's an exercise in a slow reading of the world so that our life is accelerated by intuition and the beauty of diverse perspective. You may know Louis McNeese's poem, Snow. The room was suddenly rich and the great bay window was spawning snow and pink roses against it soundlessly collateral and incompatible. World is suddener than we fancy it. World is crazier and more of it than we think. Incorrigibly plural. I peel and portion a tangerine and spit the pips and feel the drunkenness of things being various. And the fire flames with a bubbling sound, for world is more spiteful and gay than one supposes. On the tongue, on the eyes, on the ears, in the palms of one's hands, there is more than glass between the snow and the huge roses. Poetry greets the world as being incorrigibly plural. Now, anyone who writes or speaks about poems, as I do from time to time, must say a prayer. Lord, lead us not into interpretation. (laughs) And so I will try and stop myself this evening, but I wanted to finish by reading four poems that I think have an element of this mercy in them. The American poet Wallace Stevens used to say that people ought to like poetry the way children like snow. And in the stark, clear, warm chill of poetry, you see something of your own breath as you immerse yourself in a world reimagined, like a child looking out the window when it's been snowing. We play truant from the prosaic and we attend to life's unseen depth. A poem forms us more than informs us, promising more of us at the end than at the beginning. And that's why I believe, by the way, that it is religion's true native language. And a poet uses his or her words to help form us, even transform us, to help us reimagine, to see things not yet seen, or see things again that we've seen too often and now miss. That is all a great mercy. 
And the first poem I'll read is by Mary Oliver. As I think that she is a poet that helps us have mercy on ourselves. When shame is paralyzing. When we hurt because we are hurt. When we see ourselves distracted and roaming for peace somewhere. Oliver stops us in the wilderness of the world and reminds us that those who discover mercy will be the ones who will give it. Mercy in and mercy to your self. The journey. One day you finally knew what you had to do and began Though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice, though the whole house began to tremble and you felt the old tug at your ankles, mend my life, each voice cried. But you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do. Though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations, though their melancholy was terrible, It was already late enough, and a wild night, and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voice behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds, and there was a new voice which you slowly recognized as your own, that kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life that you could save. The second poem reveals that mercy that the natural world has on us a rescuing again of our humanity by the integrity of our environment, of the creation. The Peace of Wild Things is by by Wendell Berry. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought or grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. The third poem has a mercy on human and relationship frailty, holding them unapologetically as a beautiful, precious, and mortal thing. In this um, gladiatorial world of ours, where if we're not at the table, we're probably on the menu, (laughs) this is a great mercy that speaks to us of the peace of your life's circle. It's called Names by Wendy Cope. She was Eliza for a few weeks when she was a baby. Eliza Lily. Soon it changed to Lil. Later, she was Miss Steward in the baker's shop. And then, my love, my darling, mother, Widowed at 30, she went back to work as Mrs. Hand. Her daughter grew up, married, and gave birth. 
Now she was Nana. Everybody calls me Nana, she would say to visitors, and so they did, friends, tradesmen, the doctor. In the geriatric ward, they used the patient's Christian names. Lil, we said, or Nana. But it wasn't in her file. And for those last bewildered weeks, she was Eliza once again. As so often with mercy, there's also some discomfort in that poem. It wasn't in her file should make us angry, should make us want to change things. Helen Dunmore, though chiefly known as a novelist, began her writing career writing poems and in her collection of last year, Inside the Wave, she ends her life doing the same. The poems of Inside the Wave reflect on her terminal cancer diagnosis and impending death. Many of the poems in that collection, which I really commend to you, were crafted on a hospital bed. And several years ago, uh, Dunmore said that she was trying to do without scaffolding in her poetry. And the poems in that collection are alert, generous, and very contained, and their resonance is born of a, of a distillation, consciously mortal, intuitive fascination with the world in which she is still alive. Here is her poem, My Life's Stem was cut. My life's stem was cut, but quickly, lovingly, I was lifted up, I heard the rush of the tap, and I was set in water, in the blue vase, beautiful, in lip and curve. And here I am, opening one petal as the tea cools. I wait while the sun moves and the bees finish their dancing. I know I am dying, but why not keep flowering as long as I can from my cut stem? Reading her poems reminds me of the words of Zechariah in Luke's Gospel, giving light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. And even death, in her little poem, Hold Out Your Arms, which she wrote just ten days before she died, is seen as a mother. She writes, As you push back my hair, which could do with a comb, but never mind, you murmur, we're nearly there. Mercy, even on death. Finally, there's the mercy of God. Jesus was a wonderful poet about that mercy. The God he spoke of in a persistently figurative way can no more stop being merciful than a waterfall can stop being wet. The poetry of the prodigal son is as merciful to us in shaping our view of God as it is in showing us that God is merciful. George Herbert, of whom this little book I've got coming out, wonderful Christmas present, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but George Herbert is a poet really worth getting to know for anyone who's interested in humanity's inner being, the benefits of honesty, the mystery and love of God, and what we can make of religion in a world of projections. And uh, he's had incredible sort of um, appreciation across the board when you think um, that Charles I read George Herbert in prison and Oliver Cromwell's chaplain recommended him to his friends. Samuel Coleridge, as um, uh, Malcolm will tell you, said that Herbert helped him with his tendency to self-contempt. And surely one of the lasting influences on me is his insistence that God is the loving friend of human beings and not some overbearing distant tyrant. 
He's a friend who he banters with and even berates. You will know this last poem, his love three. You probably know the story that when he was dying, he put together his poems and uh, that had never been published, and he sent them to his friend Nicholas Ferrer with a little note saying, if you think they're any good, you might do something with them. If not, put them on the fire. About 170 of the poems. And he placed this one right at the end, simply called Love. Um, Herbert was one of the first people to give titles to poems, and uh, it's all, almost really him saying love has to be the final word. Here it is. Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful, Ah, oh, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, Who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not says love, who bore the blame. My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. I apologize to any of you who know the little story I'm going to end with about this poem because it is in the splash of words but my grandparents brought me up as a child and I was asked to preach uh, once in Dresden at the Frauenkirche there and uh, I know that my grandfather who um, died when I was 14 he was always a bit of a hero to me I knew he'd been in the RAF but he would never talk to me as a boy about his experiences in the war but one day when we were alone in the car, he did a little bit. And I remember him talking about this word Dresden. I didn't know what it was then. And he started to weep in the car. And I remember that very vividly. So when I, all these years later, had read my history a bit and uh, went to Dresden, he was very much in my mind as I remembered him. And on the way to the train station at the end, um, the taxi driver was very chatty. And he said, oh, have you enjoyed yourself? And I said, yes, I've always wanted to come. It's wonderful. And he said, why have you always wanted to come here? And I, I took a very deep breath, and I said, I was brought up by my grandparents and my grandfather. I now have his little log book, and I know that he was in a Lancaster bomber on the 14th of February, 1945, and he would never talk to me about it. And the taxi driver was very quiet. And then he said, ah... That was the night my mother was killed. And uh, he then pulled the car over and he turned round to me in the back and he held out his hand and he said, and now you and I shake hands, which we did. We got to the station. He wouldn't take my money. And he said, you and I will remember this for the rest of our lives. It's true. And as I got on the train back to Berlin from Dresden, all I could think about that man and what he'd just done was those words of Herbert. Love took my hand and smiling did reply. He was a man of mercy. And Herbert knew that that is the nature of God 400 years before I had even had a clue about it. So poetry is a mercy to the human soul. 
It rescues us from warm shallows that drown us. In poems, a gentle mercy is so often shown towards and within the self, the natural world, our love and relationships, even death, and the flawed, failing soul who tries to stand before God. To remove poetry from this world would be to remove its soul. For as some poetry bears witness, and here I end with, of course, those words of Shakespeare that have inspired this series. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. It is mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. Therefore, though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy. And that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, ending with Herbert and then Shakespeare, you can't really follow that. Um, I do want to pick up on the, the Shakespeare in a minute, but uh, I was glad um, Mark mentioned that idea that uh, the prayer for all poetry lovers was um, lead us not into interpretation. Um, I, I always think when I'm talking about or sharing poetry that actually that's a prayer I should follow up, as I sometimes do, with a minor exorcism. Um, that is to say, should the shade, uh, the unforgotten and unrested shade of a bagged bad English teacher be lingering on the margins of your mind somewhere, the kind of te teacher who made you feel that poetry was some sort of curious cryptic crossword puzzle to which only she had the answer, or the kind of teacher described by the, by the uh, Texan poet Billy Collins, who said all she wanted to do was tie the poem to a chair and beat it with a hosepipe till it confessed what it meant. Uh, <laughs> whereas he said, I wanted to put my ear up to the murmuring hive of the poem and wonder what honey the innumerable bees of its words were making. But um, anyway, should, should such uh, the shade of such a teacher be lingering on the margins of your mind, we can say... Depart now, go to the place appointed for you and never return. So that sets us free to enjoy poetry. I was asked in my brief, uh, thinking about the quality of mercy in poetry, actually to look through some of my own poems and draw out moments where I thought the mercy and the compassion and the love and pity of God uh, were um, given voice. And that's what I'm going to do. And um, you have a handout with... Uh, some of the poems I want to open out. But I will start, as Mark ended with the Shakespeare, um, that astonishing speech. I will start with it. And um, in one way, that famous line, that the quality of mercy is not strained, it droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It's very beautiful. It's very right. It's very soothing. It has that sense that the rain softens the earth, but also makes it a place of generosity and growth, and it's generative. Those things are true. And 
the poem, the, the passage in Merchant of Venice does work with a very vertical axis. And it does see, as it were, God above and the mercy above, and the mercy coming down as the rain. And indeed, it talks about mercy being higher even than the sceptred sway of kings. It puts it up there and has it dropping down. Um, but uh, the good news is even better news than that. For me, the extraordinary thing is that the mercy of God is not simply shed from above upon the place beneath, but that mercy himself, God as mercy, God as love, comes down to us and with us and in us in the place beneath. And that if we're to speak of the springs of love and mercy, they're not just dropping from the heavens. They're welling up from the earth. They're welling up even in the midst of the dry places. And they're welling up in the human heart because God too chose to have a human heart. And that's, I suppose, where quite a lot of the, the poetry that I've written comes from. The, the first um, volume of full volume of poetry I published was, was, was called um, Sounding the Seasons and it went through the, the Christian year and um, was poems that were meant to sort of be in conversation with the great seasons and the scriptures that went with them. And I did a poem for each of the days in Holy Week and in the church that I was part of then we, we set aside one of the great stories or moments in the Holy Week narrative and reflected on it each evening and on the Monday of Holy Week in the church I served, we used to think about the moment when Jesus looks at Jerusalem and weeps. And these tears rise rather than falling. And um, so I wrote a poem uh, called Jesus Weeps, which I'm going to read to you. Jesus Weeps just in itself, of course, is, uh, as some people say, the shortest sentence in scripture. And uh, Jesus wept, and uh, certainly uh, the most, one of the most important. So here's uh, the poem, Jesus Weeps. Jesus comes near, and he beholds the city, and looks on us with tears in his eyes, and wells of mercy, streams of love and pity, flow from that fountain whence all things arise. He loved us into life and longs to gather and meet with his beloved face to face. How often has he called a careful mother and wept for our refusals of his grace, wept for a world that weary with its weeping, benumbed and stumbling, <coughs> turns the other way. Fatigued compassion is already sleeping while her worst nightmares stalk the light of day. But we might waken yet and face those fears if we could see ourselves through Jesus' tears. So, as I say, that sonnet was a meditation really on a single verse in, in Luke. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. It's actually, I don't think I've ever read that poem aloud in the heart of a great city <laughs> like this. It's good to do that. So it is hard, of course, to see through tears, but sometimes it's the only way to see. And tears, for all of us in our own lives, tears can be the turning point. They can be the springs of renewal. And just to know that you have been wept for is to know that you've been loved. So I have a God who knows what it is to weep and who weeps for me and weeps with me and understands the depths and from the inside of what the great pagan poet Virgil called St. Rerum Lacrimae, the tears of things. In the first part of the sonnet, the octet as it's called, the first eight lines, I try to contemplate the tears of Christ, of his compassion. But um, sonnets, um, there's a sort of traditional way of 
turning or breaking them. You have the octet and the sestet, the eight and the six. And the Italians, who invented the sonnet, it's one of the great things, along with, with good wine and motor guzzi motorcycles that we took from the Italians. And uh, I enjoy both of those as well. But uh, So the Italians called that break, that, they, they, tend, they called it the volta, the kind of turn. And often in a sonnet, you'll get this turn around the ninth line. You, 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 you take your subject matter in a different direction or look at it from another perspective. In this case, um, at the volta which comes to me in line nine, I turn to think from Christ's weeping to the problem of our own weeping, wept for a world that weary with its weeping, benumbed and stumbling, turns the other way. I thought about the sources and the limits of our own compassion, and I felt I wanted to confront that extraordinary and telling modern phrase, compassion fatigue. Our capacity for compassion, literally com, with or alongside, passio, to be alongside the suffering of others. That capacity for compassion in us, that quality of mercy in us, is God-given, and it's part of God's image in us. And it's natural and right that when we feel compassion, that that should be accompanied by a desire to act, to do something, to respond, to alleviate the suffering we witness. For most of human history, most human beings experiencing compassion would always have had the chance to act as well as to react. Because before the media of television and then the much more dispersed media of, 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 of uh, the internet and... and um, videos being exchanged in real time on Twitter and Facebook, before all of that, if you saw a person fall, you were close enough to go and help them stand up again. And if you saw a person bleed, you were quite literally in a position to tear a rag off your clothes and bind their wounds. And just to see the fall or the bleeding or the hurt or the cry or the look on the mother's face who carries the starved child, is naturally to feel almost in a kind of flood of adrenaline and a desire to act, a compassion that turns into action. But what happens when that compassionate response is, as it were, stimulated and excited day after day through television or the, or the web at an immense distance? So that, as it were, the intimate threads of connection between compassion and compassionate action are severed. And we can become, as it were, the passive consumers of others' grief. The mind and the merciful heart are themselves so torn and frustrated and hurt by a sense of futility when compassion has no grip that we begin to experience compassion fatigue. We, we, we do what we can, of course, we can, you know, we can press the number, we can dial to donate, we can send the text, and we perhaps did that with children in need, and it's, a, you know, and I can remember doing it with Live Aid and, and all of that, you know, and we can do something, but it's not quite the same thing as looking somebody in the eye and extending a hand. So, in my sonnet, I, I felt quite bleakly. I said, fatigued compassion is already sleeping whilst her worst nightmares stalk the light of day. And I wondered if there was any way, given that we are confronted by a kind of wider knowledge than we were designed for, and yet a smaller reach than we've ever had practically, whether there was any way of responding to that. And it seemed to me that at least within the circle of faith, there is something that we do know for sure that God in Christ sees the same thing that we've just seen and feels the same compassion even more deeply that we've just felt. But that he actually can reach, he can be there, that he can absorb that, he can do something. And we can put our compassion, as it were, into his, and our tears, as it were, into his tear ducts, or perhaps let our tear ducts be his tear ducts. And that somehow, when our compassion is enchristed, 
it can be transformed and it can wake up rather than being fatigued. So that couplet at the end, we might waken yet and face those fears if we could see ourselves through Jesus' tears, Jesus weeping for us as well as for others. When I looked back through the range of poems that I'd done, just asking this question about mercy, I was really struck by kind of how often it comes up, up and how often I've needed the, the wise words and the love and the compassion of others. And I don't mean just our contemporaries, I mean the great figures of the past as well. Um, I was very affected a long time ago now, but I still have it, by a book about Julian of Norwich, um, and the book was called With Pity, Not With Blame. It was by Robert Llewellyn, and it was a sort of summary of the, the heart of Julian of Norwich's revelations of divine love. I got to know Robert Llewellyn before the end of his life, and uh, he, he was very helpful to me. So I have something of a devotion to Julian, and in my book, um, uh, The Singing Bowl, I had a little sequence of sonnets for the, the saints of this island, and I wrote a sonnet for Julian, and I thought I'd like to, to read that here as well. Norwich was not the end of the line back in Julian's day. It was a major European hub. There was constant sea traffic and barge traffic. And her two windows of her anchorite cell, one looked in on the sacrament and the other looked out on the busy street, rather as this church does. And she, even in the deepness of her, her extraordinary grounding as an anchoress, was also absolutely open to the word on the street and the sufferings on the street and the people who came to her day by day. So this is a poem addressed directly uh, to Julian. It's a prayer to her to help me, to help us now in this very question of pity and compassion. Julian of Norwich. Show me, O anchoress, your anchor hold deep in the love of God and hold me fast. Show me again in whose hands we are held. Speak to me from your window in the past. Tell me again the tale of love's compassion for all of us who fall into the mire. How he is wounded with us. How his passion quickens the love that haunted our desire. Show me again the wonder of at one of Christ in us distinct and yet the same, who makes and loves and keeps us in each moment and looks on us with pity, not with blame. Keep telling me, for all my faith may waver. Love is his meaning, only love forever and as many of you will know that that really is that she asks what his meaning is and is told love is his meaning and she sees the the whole of creation uh, I used to remember that passage about the whole of creation like the size of a hazelnut and I used to think of it as that she'd seen it in the palm of Christ's hands but when I back, went back to look at it again I realized he showed me a thing in the palm of my hand <laughs> about the size of a hazelnut. And it was everything. And God knows it and loves it and maintains it and has mercy on it. So um, sometimes we need to be taken, whether by poetry or devotional theology, back to these great insights and just to be reminded of that big picture so that we're not overcome by the assaults of the immediate. Um, I, Mark had that phrase about you know if you're uh, if you're not on the, if you're not at the table you're on the menu uh, about the mercilessness, the pitilessness of our culture, and uh, it's an extraordinarily kind of competitive culture, isn't it? Um, uh, one of the things I think Mark and I will have in common that as 
as clergy in Cambridge, and particularly as deans or chaplains, we really are subverting the whole place because the whole place depends on massive competition. And um, we're here to preach uh, radical forgiveness and love and compassion, um, just as they're about to sit their finals, having had it dinned into them that the fate of nations depends on this exam. We're there to tell them, God will love you just as much if you fail. <laughs> Um, I don't think the senior tutors always thank us for this, but... Um, uh, and one of the things I, I find extraordinary, um, when one's looking at the, the, the radical transition that was made when Christianity was born into that world of late pagan antiquity, wonderful as the art and poetry and many of the other features of late pagan antiquity were, you know, you know everything you need to know when you think about the gods on Olympus. The Olympian gods and the fact that we call the Olympics still the Olympics and that that is all about competitive and who's first and who gets gold and who stands on the highest bit of the podium. And there is something in the gospel that is always subverting that. And uh, I once wrote um, uh, a poem. In fact, it was originally a short three-verse poem and then a Canadian friend of mine turned it into a song and said, I need three more verses for the song. You haven't finished. Um, so it became this poem, Descent. Um, it wasn't written to be a song. I, it's written in, in what are pleasingly called English sapphics. So this is a, a meter borrowed from Sappho, um, the great uh, love poet. But George Herbert loved English sapphics. And English sapphics work with a kind of diminuendo. You have three f lines of eight syllables and four stresses, three lines of tetrameter, as it's called. And then for the fourth line, where you, you'd be expecting another eight syllables and four stresses, it's compressed down. It diminishes. It's just the four stresses. It's just four words. All the, everything else is left out. And it seemed to me a good meter in which to explore the sheer contradiction against the Olympians that Christianity and the story of Mary at Bethlehem and the child in the manger tell us. So I'll read you that poem in a, a meter borrowed from Sappho via George Herbert. Descent. They sought to soar into the skies, those classic gods of high renown, for lofty pride aspires to rise. But you came down. You dropped down from the mountain sheer, forsook the eagle for the dove. The other gods demanded fear, but you gave love. Where chiseled marble seemed to freeze their abstract and perfected form, Compassion brought you to your knees. Your blood was warm. They called for blood in sacrifice and victims on their altars bled. When no one else could pay the price, you died instead. They towered above our mortal plane, dismissed this restless flesh with scorn, aloof from birth and death and pain but you were born born to these burdens born by all born with us all astride the grave weak to be with us when we fall and strong to save um, you see I put the words astride the grave in a little inverted commas, I was acknowledging a borrowing. Um, and the borrowing, of course, is from Samuel Beckett, who might be deeply annoyed to be quoted in a Christian poem. Uh, but um, I'm sure he can live with that now. I love Beckett. I loved Beckett before I was a Christian when I was a full-on, you know, angst-ridden existentialist teenager. Um, Beckett was, was essential to me then, but he's still essential to me now. Um, and uh, he's a kind of desert father of modernism really but uh, you may remember that extraordinary line in Waiting for Godot about the quickness of time they give birth 
astride the grave. The light gleams for an, in for an instant, but then all is darkness. But even in that gleaming instant of light, even in waiting for God, you see Astrogod and Vladimir having extraordinary compassion on one another, and all of us having a kind of compassion on them. And I still ask that open question that they ask when one of them is standing on one leg in their rags and says, do you think God sees me? Um, coming towards the end of, of the ones I, I want to read, um, I wrote a book called um, Parable and Paradox, which was sort of sitting at the feet of Jesus and trying to hear the teaching again and respond to it, sometimes channeling my inner doubting Thomas, sometimes just, just, just responding as I, as I am. And um, I came to the lovely story about the healing of the man who is deaf and has a speech impediment. And um, this has a very vivid memory for me as a small child, because I was taken to church a lot. My father was a Methodist local preacher, and most of it passed me by, and I would sit sort of twiddling my thumbs or doodling in the pew while, while the readings were going on or my father was preaching. But one day I was particularly struck by a moment in the gospel which just suddenly I tuned into and it's, I think I tuned into it as a sort of seven year old boy because it was about spitting and it said Jesus spat and I'd just been told in no uncertain terms by my mother that very morning that I shouldn't spit so I, I thought it's just wonderful so I tuned in at the Jesus spat bit and then the, the reader in this very respectable suit and tie, went on to say that he spat, and then he made a kind of mud pie with his hands, with the spit, and then he put it you know, on the person's eyes and on their tongue, and he spat and put his finger on their tongue. And I was going, wow, that? like, where was Mary? How did he get away with that? But of course, later, that's the reading where you... It was obviously such a vivid memory for the writers that they actually give you the Aramaic word that Jesus said when he put the spittle on the man's tongue, when he said, Ephtatha, be opened. And I always remember, because it was about somebody with a speech impediment, and actually you can't say Ephtatha without sort of slightly sounding as if you have a speech <laughs> impediment. But anyway, um, later when I wrote this poem, Poetry Sequence, it was not the spitting or the epithatha. It was the words, be opened. Talking about mercy and compassion. And I felt so strongly that this was a word to the church to be taken aside. So this is a church which has indeed been opened and is still open and being opened. But maybe you know some churches that could hear this. So I'm going to read you, be opened. Be opened. Oh, <clears throat> if only we might be. Speak to a heart that's closed in on itself. Be opened and the truth will set you free. Speak to a world imprisoned in its wealth. Be opened. Learn to learn from poverty. Speak to a church that closes and excludes and makes rejection its own litany. Be opened opened to the multitudes for whom I died, but whom you have dismissed. Be opened, opened, opened. How you sigh, and still we do not hear you. We have missed both cry and crisis. We make no reply. Take us aside, for we are deaf and dumb. Spit on us, Lord, and touch each tongue-tied tongue. So I think my time is probably coming towards an end. I shan't do uh, all of these poems, but I'd like to read uh, the poem Father Forgive from that same Parable and Paradox collection, which is um, based on Luke's account Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus, as the nails are being driven in, saying the word, forgive. And of course, you know at Coventry Cathedral, those words, Father, forgive, spoken by the... Not Father, forgive them. Not them and us. But Father, forgive. And then that great relationship between Coventry and Dresden begins. So, Father, forgive.
Father, forgive. And so, forgiveness flows. Flows from the very wound our hatred makes. Flows through the taunts, the curses and the blows. Flows through our wasted world, a healing spring, welling and cleansing, washing all the marks away, the scores and scars of every wrong. Forgiveness flows to where we need it most, right in the pit and smithy of our sin, just where the dreadful nails are driven in, just where our woundedness has done its worst. We know your cry of pain should be a curse, yet turn to you and find we have been blessed. We know not what we we do, but heaven knows for every sin on earth, forgiveness flows. So I'd like to close now with one poem from um, the new collection that I've uh, just published called After Prayer, which is what it says on the tin. It's a series of responses to George Herbert's astonishing poem, Prayer, a little sonnet that consists of a cascade of 26 images of prayer, followed by the modest words, something understood. Um, and I took each of these and, and made something of it. Um, I'm going to read the one called Peace. Um, I was already seeing how much our own country was fracturing as I wrote this. I was thinking too also about the experience of my friends in Ireland and Northern Ireland. And um, prayer, says George Herbert, is peace. He says softness and peace and joy and love and bliss. But I don't think Herbert intends a naive or evasive or fantasy peace. Uh, So I thought I'd have a go at the kind of peace that the quality of real mercy might bring. And I'll, I'll end with this sonnet. Peace. Not as the world gives. Not the victor's peace. Not to be fought for, hard won or achieved. Just grace and mercy gratefully received. An undeserved and unforeseen release as the cold chains of memory and wrath fall from our hearts before we are aware their rusty locks all picked by patient prayer till closed doors open and we see a path Descending from a source we cannot see, a path that must be taken hand in hand, only by those, forgiving and forgiven, who see their saviour in their enemy. So, reach for me. We'll cross our broken land and make each other bridges back to heaven.